We're here this morning, though, to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Around the world, there will be Christians doing this, people doing this, and we do it every Lord's Day. As the Bible tells us to do it, we have the communion that's set. And we remember His body that was broken for us, His blood that was shed for us, and, and as so many people do it, we have to ask the question, well, why does this happen? What, what is this about this one event, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that everybody kind of stops at least for one day out of the year and hopefully for 52 Sundays, Thursdays of the week out of the year, to step back and to remember what Jesus has done for us why it is so vitally important to us that we should be thinking about it, that we should keep it in our memories. What is it about this event that, that, that speaks to us, not only to our minds, but to our hearts, to the emotions that we have, that the love of God was so great for us that He sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross for us, that we, who believe shouldn't perish. That we would have a way of life, eternal life, presented before us. What does that mean to us? What should it mean to us? Those are the things that we want to look at this morning. Just a very basic uh, a sermon. And, and we, we start off with Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. One of the most important verses in the Bible. And this ought to get us to thinking. It's verse 6, Matthew chapter 28. He is not here, for He is risen. As He said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. And that's past tense. This is where He lay for three days in the grave. But come and look at it. Come and examine it. He's not there. He has risen. He said that He would rise from the dead. He said that there would be this resurrection. And there would be many things that His resurrection would prove. That is a point in time, a reference that we can look to and we can say, everything changes right there. But we've heard of game changers. If you like football games, basketball games, Whatever game there is, somewhere along the line as that game is being played, something will happen, something significant. And, and, and somebody will say, the announcer will say, or a fan will say, ah, that's a game-changing play, or that's a game-changing moment. Listen, for the world, all universe, all creation, that was the game-changing moment right there that we can look at in the past and say, the last game-changing moment, the one that took place at the fall, it's over. The devil is beaten. He's beaten, he's defeated, he can't win. Now we've got this choice. We can either apply ourselves to a defeated system, or we can apply ourselves to the winning system. We can apply ourselves to following Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Son of God, the one whom God has raised from the dead and set before us and now has told us there's going to be another game-changing moment coming in the future. That's when the Father will say to the Son, go get your bride. Go back Get the ones who have applied themselves to knowing you and following you. Those ones whose lives are pure within you and bring them to our home in heaven for eternity. That's the next moment that we look for. That's a game-changing moment when this world is destroyed and, and we live in a new world world. A new being. Wonderful as the scripture tells us. But look at 
let's get back to this game-changing moment. Why was this resurrection of Jesus such a game-changing moment for the world? And hopefully for each and every one of us as individuals, because it has to be for us as individuals. It has to change us. It has to transform us. It has to make us different. If it doesn't, we're on the losing side. What is the importance of this event? There's no use talking about it if it's not important, right? Well, what do people tell you? Don't talk about politics and religion. Why not? Who said that? People who were wrong about politics and religion and didn't want to be told what was correct. Or at least didn't want to hear the other person's side. Politics and religion, and we can almost drop out of politics anymore, but religion is the most important thing that we should talk about because it, it, it speaks about who we are, why we're here. Oh, why has God created us? What does He expect of us? What can we do to be in a right relationship with God? So it's important. If it wasn't important, let's talk about it like the weather, like a lot of people do. Just talk about it like I went to church, I did this, I did that. Oh, what do you believe? Well, I don't want to get into that. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. It's important. Religion is important. According to the Apostle Paul, it is of first importance. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. He says, For I delivered to you first of all, as the most important thing, that which also I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, which means it was prophesied, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. His death, burial, and resurrection was no accident like some people teach. Do you realize that? that? There's a group of people out there that teach, oh, it was an accident. He came to be king, but the people crucified him, so God had to come up with something else, so this is what happened. No, 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 no. Scripture says this was what was going to happen. Paul said to the, the, the Jews, look in your Scripture. It's there. It's telling you about this event. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, Christianity is a lie. Christianity as the New Testament sets it forth. Christianity as God sets it forth. Not as, as man sets it forth. As man sets it forth. You, you, you can go out there, you can hear just about anything being told. This is what the Bible says, and this is what we do, and what have you. But if Jesus Christ is not raised from the dead, as the Scripture tells us, Christianity is a lie, and we're kind of stupid and foolish for following it. Right? That's an importance of it, because it's not a lie. And we'll get into the validity of it in a moment. The Apostle Peter, the, the one who was close to Jesus, the one who on the, the day of Pentecost stood up with the other apostles, and he was probably the main speaker. Here's someone who knew what Christianity was about. Listen to what he says, 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 21. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. But notice what he says. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism saves us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because of the connection that God makes. The connection that God has made from the beginning. Here, here was the world. It was in chaos. It was covered with water. He brought order into it. Here was uh, God bringing the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. Water on one side, water on the other side. God controlled that. God brought order to it. The nation of Israel crossed. The Egyptians who didn't believe in God, they tried to come through. The water crushed them. Chaos. See, water can be used for destructive purposes and water can be used for salvation purposes. And that's what the Bible tells us. When we use it according to what the Bible tells us, it's a salvation issue. And when we use it the wrong way, because of the chaos, it's destruction to us. But again, it's because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the connection that we make. The, the 
uh, the model that was shown to us. And the model that, that the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 17, God be thanked that though <laughs> you were sinners and though you were lost and all these things, you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. Well, what form of doctrine was that? Death, burial, resurrection. The same as Jesus. But for us, it's in the waters of baptism. The resurrection confirms the claims of Jesus to be the Son of God and accomplishes the purposes for which He came into this world. If there's no resurrection, then anything that you would read about Jesus in the Bible is just make-believe. It's made up. It, it, it can't be true. Because of the resurrection, it proves it's true. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Listen to this for just a moment. Now listen. But when He again brings the firstborn into the world, who's that? Well, that's God the Father, right? And what's He talking about? He's talking about bringing Jesus into the world again. Now, He's not talking about the second coming there. He's talking about the resurrection. Jesus came into the world. The Word was made flesh in the form of Jesus of Nazareth. He came into the world. He left when He died on the cross and His body was buried. But He came back. And when He came back, let all the angels of God worship Him. And of the angels, He says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But to the Son, to the Son, to the Word who became flesh, who's now the Son, the one who left, but the one who was resurrected from the dead, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. The resurrection of Jesus Christ proves that He is the Son of God. That He was the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. That's why the resurrection is important. Because if it happened, it's going to do something to you. You have to think about it. You have to dwell upon it. You have to make a choice. Am I going to believe this? Or am I going to disbelieve it? Well, why is that important? Well, because the validity of the, the, the act or the event. There's no sense talking about it if it's not true. Would you agree with me? There's no use of us talking about the resurrection of Jesus... And there's no use of us talking about Easter or any of this stuff if it's not true. Why would we want to talk about it? That would just be a bunch of foolishness, wouldn't it? But because it's true, we better think about it. According to Paul, the Apostle Paul, there was a host of witnesses to this resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 5 through 8. And that he was seen, this is picking up from where we left off before, about the importance, but he says, and he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter. Then by the twelve, all of them gathered together, the twelve, there's eleven of them, but yet it's, it's that core group, the apostles. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to the present. And when Paul wrote this, what he was saying is, you don't believe me? There are 500 people down there who saw it. You can go and talk to them. You can go pick their brain. You can try to get them to, to say, no, it's a lie or whatever. They're going to tell you the truth. They witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There remained this time that some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, that's the Lord's brother, then by all the apostles again, probably in Galilee, then last of all, he was seen by me also. Last of all. Nobody's seen Jesus since then. Paul is the last one to see him. And we know about his 
conversion as by one born out of due time, a due season. We believe the witnesses. We believe the testimony that they have left for us. Listen, if it's not true, don't believe it. But you have to go back, cross-examine all of these individuals. You have to say that all of them are liars. All of them were misled. What have you? But that's the proof that we have. Matthew records the resurrection, not only of Jesus, but of others at the same time. Chapter 27, verses 51 through 53. Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When those graves were opened, those old saints, I don't know who was there, maybe David was there, maybe uh, Moses was there, maybe, maybe some of the prophets, but they went into the city and they talked with the people. Well, at least the people saw them. I imagine the people talked to them. Who are you and what are you doing here? Here's who I am. What a great thing's happened. You realize nobody refused that. Nobody in those days refused these things that were happening. Nobody says, well, some say it was a lot, but for the most part, the ones who were there, the ones who were saw, even the ones who didn't believe in Jesus, they couldn't deny it. All they could do is say, you don't preach and teach in the name of Jesus anymore. You don't go around telling people about that. <coughs> body was gone. The angel said, he's not here. He's risen. Like he said, who took the body? Who took the body? Who would have taken the body? You think the Jews took it? Why would the Jews have taken it? it the Jews didn't want that body to come out of the grave. That, was, that would prove that he was the Messiah. That would prove that he was the Son of God. They wanted that body in there. They even went to Pilate and says, Put a guard around that body, around that grave. And he did. They wouldn't have taken that body. The worst thing that, that could have happened, well, the best thing that could have happened for them, if they had taken, it, taken the body, yeah. is when Peter got up and said that Jesus is resurrected from the dead, they'd just thrown that body out there and said, no, here it is. They could have. Because he just resurrected from the dead and he had ascended to heaven. A bodily resurrection. Had the Romans taken it? Well, why would the Romans take it? They didn't have a dog in this fight. Uh, no place in the argument. Uh, they did it. They put the guard around there to, to appease the Jews. But what did they care? They didn't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in what the Jews taught anyway. To them, Jesus was just another dead Jew. And it didn't make any difference to them. Well, how about the disciples? Would the disciples have, have taken the body? Remember where the disciples were. They were hiding. They were in the upper room. They were waiting there. And they were afraid that they were the ones who were going to be next. And you know something? Hey, listen to this. When the tomb was found empty, they were just as surprised as everybody else. And they didn't know what to think about it. And Jesus had been telling them that he was going to be resurrected. There was no legitimate refutation of the facts of Jesus' resurrection in the following days. Those people who could have stood up and said, here's the body, or there's the body, the people who said, could have stood up and said, this isn't true, they couldn't. And that's why on the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood up before all of those Jewish worshipers, people who had been there 50 days earlier, seen what had happened, saw what went on around the temple, the earthquake, the darkness, 
when Peter stood up and a new miracle was taking place in front of him and said, This Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. What does it say? They were cut to the heart and they said, Men and brethren, what must we do? What do you mean do? What must we do to be saved? And Peter taught them the gospel. Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You're going to have some peace with God because you're going to be reconciled by the blood of Jesus Christ. Validity. The validity of the message. It's important, see? It's important or we wouldn't be talking about it. It's true, it's valid, or we wouldn't be talking about it. It would make no sense. So if it's important, and if it's true, what does it mean to us? What does it mean to me? And what does it mean to you? Number one, it means that God has power over life and death. Death is not the end. There's another event coming. It's the resurrection. Well, how do we know it's going to happen? Because He raised Jesus from the dead. Man, uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now that's a spiritual resurrection, but it also is speaking about Jesus was raised from the dead. One of these days, we're going to be raised from the dead. Our bodies are going to come out of the tomb, out of the graves, and we're going to stand before our God in judgment. It means secondly, that Jesus is the Son of God. Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. Again, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Go back to Hebrews chapter 1. Your throne, O God, because of that resurrection, we should worship God through Jesus Christ. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of the worship of the angels of God. But it's because of that resurrection. But He is the Son of God. And because He is God, the Son of God, listen folks, He can save us. If we respond to Him by faith and obedience to the Gospel message, He'll reconcile us. And He'll grow us. But we have to allow Him. It means, third, that there will be a day when we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive of the deeds we have done in the body, whether they have been good or whether they have been bad. Who, who determines whether they're good or whether they're bad? Well, Jesus gets to determine that. He's already told us in His Word what is good and what is bad. So we need to be informed, instructed from His Word, the good, so that when that time comes, when we stand before judgment, before God the Son, that we will be found worthy. Worthy of eternal life, not eternal condemnation. Acts chapter 17 and verse 31, Because He has appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness, by the man, that's Jesus Christ, whom he has ordained, he has given us assurance to this to all by raising him from the dead. How do I know there's going to be a judgment day? God raised Jesus from the dead. There wasn't anybody standing over him, waving arms, crying out. God raised him from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus is a valid historical fact. You realize there is more evidence about Jesus and His death, burial, and resurrection than there is about any other person, any other event in olden times and antiquity. Why is it doubted? Why, why do scholars doubt it? Why do supposedly intelligent people doubt it? Here's why. 
because they don't want to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They don't want to believe it happened, and they don't want you to believe it happened. But the testimony, the testimony of the Word of God, the testimony of the time, the testimony that's out there in the secular realm, that if you simply look at it, the testimony is that there is an empty grave back in the holy land and there's no explanation except that Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of God so it's important for you and for me to understand that it's important because it's true and because it's true it has meaning for us whether we believe it or obey it or whether we disbelieve determine where we stand eternally. But that's why this event, that's why when we come together and we do this in remembrance of Him is so important because when we do this we are saying I believe in Jesus. Bless is yours. Thank you so much for your time. If you're here this morning, you're not a child of God. We give you the opportunity to do so. Repent. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. Maybe you've done that in the past, but for some reason, you just really haven't taken it seriously. <coughs> this is serious. You need to come back. See the seriousness of it. Live according to the seriousness of it. But we give you the opportunity to repent. Seek the prayers of God's people to bring you back into a right relationship with God. If you have me, please come take a seat here in the front as we stand and sing the invitation.